Well, tonight we're going to talk about UFOs, why people believe in UFOs, and we're going to also look at the reports of alien encounters. People have reported actually being visited by aliens or abducted and taken up into their spacecrafts. Before I get to the body of my talk, though, I want to give everyone an opportunity to, to take down, to capture the lecture notes. So this is just a QR code. All you have to do is point your phone to the QR code. A prompt should pop up on your cell phone that will allow you to download a PDF file of my lecture notes. They may be a little different than the ones I'm using now, but because uh, I update this presentation frequently, but should be basically the same. Okay. Well, due to the pervasive teachings of naturalism, that life came about through purely natural processes, those that have, have accepted these teachings as true and adopted this as a worldview today just assume that the life must have evolved elsewhere in the universe. And many believe that the universe must be awash with life. When this teaching is combined with, with the, the teaching that the universe is 13.9 billion years old, many assume that there must be or much older, technologically advanced civilizations out there in the universe, and they, they likely have visited Earth in the past. These teachings, however, are in direct conflict with the biblical creation and with Christian doctrine. In the Bible, it states that God created the universe over the course of six days, and five of those days were spent creating the Earth and its inhabitants. The Bible also states in 1 Peter 3.18, that Christ suffered for sins once for all time. This, these teachings, this view about, about UFOs and uh, other civilizations out there in the universe are in conflict with the Bible, and there's just no biblical support for them. And sadly, these te teachings have in fact caused many to believe that, this, that the supernatural beings and miracles in the Bible can be att attributed to benef benevolent aliens that were perhaps mistaken as angels or even God, and that these angels may even have been mankind's creators. Perhaps the most notable example are the chariots of fire mentioned in 2 Kings that appeared before Elijah was taken up into a whirlwind in heaven, or Ezekiel's description of the glory of God and the cherubim. In fact, both of these, the chariots of fire and the cherubim, may be referring to the same thing. It, that that uh, <clears throat> the chariots of fire may, in fact, be a reference to the cherubim, as the cherubim are described as having wheels, wheel a wheel within a wheel. Or Ezekiel says in his hearing that they were called the whirling wheels. Let me read just an excerpt of this description of the cherubim from Ezekiel 1. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And skip to verse 15. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And the rims were tall and awesome. And the rims of all four, all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose, the wheels when the, rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Well, polls have found that 70 to 80% of people today believe that intelligent life exists in outer space. A 2019 Gallup poll found that one third of, US, of the US population, that would be about 110 million people, said they thought some UFOs are alien spacecraft. The majority of adults, however, about 60%, said that UFOs can be explained by human activity or natural phenomena. So, we want to examine what has caused the, be the belief amongst people that UFOs are extraterrestrial aliens from outer space. We want to examine the reasons for this belief and determine if there's any credibility to it. 
Well, the number one reason, without a doubt, the number one reason is that the spontaneous appearance of life has been accepted by natural science and is taught as a matter of fact today in our public schools, even though there is literally no evidence to support the claim. We're going to be looking at this, at the number one reason, at this claim a little bit later, but I want to make the point again that scientists have, have experimented on this, have tested this, and there's just no credible support for the origin of life through natural processes whatsoever. They can't even at this point explain how a single protein could form all by itself through purely natural processes, much less something as complex as an entire cell. But arguably, if we, if it would be correct to assume that if life originated here through purely natural processes, it would have happened elsewhere, thus the belief. Well, this view that life must exist elsewhere in the universe is endorsed today by top scientists, including the members of the National Academies of Science and NASA. In fact, one of NASA's main goals since the turn of the century has been the search for extraterrestrial life. For example, their search for what they call exoplanets. They're searching for planets elsewhere because they assume if the world, if our world evolved naturally, others would have as well. As NASA Administrator Daniel Golden stated, they are searching for Earth-like planets that may be habitable or inhabited. This is one of NASA's main goals today. Searching for exoplanets is but a small part of what is called SETI, which stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, SETI is a collective term for, this, for the scientific searches for intelligent extraterrestrial life, like monitoring electromagnetic radiation, such as radio signals for signs of transmissions from civilizations on other planets. This picture shows just a few of the 27 dish antennas of what is called the Very Large Array, a radio telescope site in Socorro, New Mexico. But there are many of such sites. NASA joined in the SETI efforts in the late 1960s. Some of their SETI-related projects include one called the Project Orion, another that's called the Microwave Observing Project, there's another called the High Resolution Microwave Survey, another that's called the Toward Other Planetary Systems. This picture shows the 300-meter Arecibo radio telescope that's in Puerto Rico which was featured in the, mo in the 1997 movie called Contact with that starred Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. You might have heard that it experienced catastrophic failure in September 2020 when the instrument platform that you see there crashed through the dish. Well, SETI is an international program that has spent billions of dollars, including millions of participants worldwide, scanning as much as 28 million radio frequencies per second. And what have they found? Well, absolutely nothing. In over 50 years, when you're talking about government waste, this is it. Billions of dollars in research that has produced no results whatsoever. Well... A third reason why there are so, such high numbers of beliefs in aliens is that our modern culture is inundated with sci-fi books, movies, and TV shows about aliens. Now, it might not seem immediately obvious, but most science fiction that depicts alien life has evolutionism at its core. If life evolved on Earth, it must have evolved elsewhere. Anyone want to guess what the most successful TV show in history was? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Yeah, Star Trek. Star Trek first aired in 1966 and has seen several spin-off series from that original. Well, for some, their belief in UFOs is linked to the enormous number of reported sightings. In the 2019 Gallup poll that I mentioned previously, 16% of the U.S. population, that's about 53 million people, admitted to having actually seen a UFO. It has been said that there are hundreds of sightings every day. However, a search for credible photographs can be frustrating and often either reveals a lack of credibility in the witness or that hoaxers are responsible. Both of these photos that I show you here are said to be hoaxes. My question is, where are the more, more recent photographs? 
I mean, today, everyone is walking around with these high-resolution cameras on their cell phones. But all we seem to be able to find are the old, questionable photos of yesteryear. Well, some of the most famous photos of UFOs were taken in Switzerland in 1975 by a guy by the name of Billy Meyer. One of them was featured prominently in the television series The X-Files and was later sold for auction at 16, for $16,500. It, it was a poster shown in Mulder's office that said, I want to believe. A very apt tagline, I think, as many do want to believe this lie like they want to believe the lie of evolution. Why do they want to believe? Well, Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall on the hands of the Almighty God. It is easier to live with sin in our life without fear if you adopt one of these false worldviews. People just want to believe that there is no God so that they can continue to live any way they want without that gripping fear with them all the time. These are two examples of nine photos taken by Billy Meyer from multiple vantage points of what is supposed to be a spacecraft circling a tree. And here is Billy Meyer. Billy Meyer is the founder of a UFO religion and claimed that he has been revisited by extraterrestrials since 1942. Well, and he is also claims that he is the seventh reincarnation after six prophets common to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He claimed that he was Enoch, then Elijah, then Isaiah, then Jeremiah, then Jesus, then Muhammad, and now he's Billy. Hmm. Well, in April 2020, the Pentagon declassified and released three videos of UFOs. The one in the center that you see here is a very compelling infrared video from 2004 of an object recorded by a Navy pilot that has been called a gimbal. Now, having seen this, these, this clip in its entirety before looking for a usable version of the video to show today, I found it very interesting that almost every clip I found had the beginning of this video trimmed off, where the first statement made over the radio is, it's a drone, bro. Let me show you that clip. This is the, this is a, a, the clip that was reported by this Navy pilot. And you see that the first thing that was said there was, it's a drone, now, it's a very compelling video, and in fact, similar incidents took place in airspaces off the coast of Virginia and North Carolina that were described as approximately the same size and shape of a drone or missile. Well, today, the official assessment of the Pentagon is that these were drones that they call unmanned aerial systems. However, the military has has been unable to identify who's operating them. If these are drones that are being operated by a country like Russia or China, it would obviously be a major security issue. The report from the Pentagon states this. In many ways, drones pose a greater mid-air risk than manned aircraft. They're oft often less visually significant and less radar apparent than manned aircraft. Well, some others have been convinced about aliens by the ancient constructions that we have found around the world, like the pyramids in Egypt, claiming we could not have built something like that. They must have had advanced uh, you know, help from some advanced civilization. Or like the Nazca lines you see here. Now, the Nazca lines are incredibly massive pieces of ancient art that, were, that are located in the arid Peruvian coastal plain. A couple of the figures are shown here next to a road to help you perceive the scale of the artwork. These are massive, massive pieces of art. And many have claimed that ancient peoples couldn't have made these, that they had to have help from more advanced civilizations. Well, the largest of the Nazca figures is approximately 1,000 feet. The longest of what they call a geoglyph goes on for around nine miles. Some have claimed that ancient people must have received help from aliens to build such things. But we've made similar things without technological help. This is Mundi Man. Mundi Man is a painting of an 
Australian stockman that covers over 5 million square meters. It was created in a year by an artist by the name of Ando with a tractor and a plow without sophisticated means like GPS coordinates, but simply mathematical calculations. For a size comparison, the Mundy Man's smile is as wide as the Empire State Building is tall. Well, some have claimed that the giant strips you see here in the Nazca Desert were ancient alien runways. But you would think that an advanced alien ship able to traverse the vast expanse of space would not need a runway to gradually come to a touchdown. But perhaps those poor aliens were just hadn't figured out yet how to land vertically. It's possible. Poor aliens hadn't figured out how to land vertically yet, still needed a runway. Mm -hmm. It's quite possible. Others were convinced of aliens by the face on Mars. A this is a picture taken of the Sidonian region of Mars by the Viking One orbiter and was released by NASA in July 1976. That many claimed was a carved face, much like the carved faces we have uh, placed on Mount Rushmore. The face on Mars was even featured in the movie Mission to Mars that featured Gary Sinise, Tim Robbins, and Don Cheadle. The plot of the movie involves the discovery of the face by the astronauts who were able to enter the face, after which a 3D animation reveals what happened to the people on Mars. That a large asteroid had crashed into Mars, rendered Mars uninhabitable. A projected humanoid alien then appears, revealing that the natives of Mars evacuated the planet in spaceships to a distant world on a distant galaxy, but one ship was sent to Earth to seed it with DNA. And this is actually a popular concept, that Earth was actually seeded by an alien civilization that is actually endorsed by some top scientist. We'll come back to this in a bit. However, in April 2001, the Mars Global Surveyor drew close enough to take a second look. The Mars team captured an extraordinary photo using the camera's maximum resolution what the picture actually shows is the Martian equivalent of a butte or a mesa, landforms common to the American West. Unfortunately, no face, no Martians. Others were convinced of the existence of aliens visiting Earth by the crop circles that started appearing in cereal crop fields in the 1970s. Quickly, the circles were claimed by ufologists to be alien of origin because we couldn't do something like that and were likely a landing site for flying saucers called Saucer Nest. I, in fact, recall when I was a, a technician at Texas Tech, my coworker at the time had a magazine article, I don't remember if it was Time Magazine or not, a magazine article that, uh, of, about the crop circles. And she found it very compelling that the stalks of wheat were bent and not broken. They were just bent over and none of them were broken, that that was significant for some reason. Well, in 1991, the hoaxers, Doug Bauer and his co-conspirator, Dave Corley, confessed and showed how they had made the crop circles. They had fooled the so-called experts for 13 years using only the simple tools that Bauer is showing here, a standing board and some rope to create these crop circles. Well, despite the original hoaxers coming forward, crop circle enthusiasts continued in their beliefs that aliens were responsible. Crop circles continued to appear and became increasingly more elaborate over time. Many were viewed as being messages from aliens requiring interpretation. A new breed of hoaxers began making more modifications on site, indicating that advanced technologies had been present. The newer true crop circles, as they were called, were marked not just by complex and precise designs, but also by deformation of grains of wheat and the presence of tiny iron particles in the vicinity of the circles. In 2002, the existence of crop circles as alien phenomena was featured in the movie Signs with Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix. In the same year, MIT students took up the challenge to analyze and reproduce crop circles on par with those being created elsewhere at the request of a Discovery Channel special called Crop Circles Mystery in the Fields. In addition to creating a, a precise geometric pattern, the actual logo of MIT is what's shown there, with perfectly straight lines, they also made a homemade device that sprayed molten iron particles. 
and another that deformed the grains of wheat using parts from a microwave oven. One of the students said this, I find it hard to put faith in the tales of crop circle constructions by aliens. I think they're a result of just free time, boredom, and a good sense of humor. And this is true, you know, people love messing with people and, uh, you know, well, hoaxers just love their hoaxes. Well, today, you can become a crop circle maker if you so desire. Cropcirclemakers.org will teach you how if you desire. Or you can hire them to create some aerial advertisement for you. Mm -hmm. No alien, alien technology required whatsoever. Well, others were convinced of the existence of aliens by a supposed flying saucer crash outside of Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. The local newspaper headline stated, Roswell Army Airfield Captures Flying Saucer on Ranch in Roswell Region. Remember the 2019 Gallup poll I mentioned previously found that the majority of adults, 60%, said that UFO sightings can be explained by human activity or natural phenomena. It also found that 68% of Americans believe that UFOs are being covered up. In fact, more Americans believe the government is hiding its knowledge of UFOs than believe that UFOs are of extraterrestrial origin. Well, this incident at Roswell and the government research facility called Area 51 are today constantly cited as arguments of government censorship or cover-ups cover of the, their knowledge of UFOs. Well, just so you know, I grew up in Roswell, New Mexico. I uh, grew up there. I went to high school there. Roswell Coyotes. Oh, well, yeah. Moved from Roswell uh, at, uh, in, the, in the early 1980s to go off to college. My dad was, in fact, born in Roswell. But I never heard about this. Never heard about this when I lived in Roswell. That's because no one had. It wasn't hyped up until someone wrote a book in 1980 called The Roswell Incident. Someone then wrote another book a few years later. It suddenly got hyped up by the media, and there you go. Now Roswell is just crazy for UFOs. I'll come back to some photos. Well, what was found at this Roswell incident? There were a, no a number of terribly non-credible witnesses that came forward claiming to have seen alien bodies and such, but most of these proved to not be worth the paper their names were written on. One of the only credible witnesses was this guy. This is Major Jesse Marcel. He was the base intelligence officer who gathered the debris that had been found by a local rancher. Debris that he described as not made by human hands. But what was found? Let's look at what was found. Here is Marcel with the debris that he collected from that ranch. It amounted to nothing more than a bunch of tinfoil, some sticks, and rubber. Why would he describe it the way he did, not made by human hands? Well, his son gave us some insight when interviewed on a, a History Channel special. His son said that his dad was obsessed with extraterrestrial aliens. He lived it and breathed it. And when he found the debris, he brought it home and told his son that he thought it was from a crashed alien spacecraft. Well, what caused people to believe a UFO cover-up had taken place is that based on Major Marcel's assessment, the base information officer issued a press release which basically said that a flying saucer, they had a flying saucer in their possession. This caused that information to appear in headlines across the country. However, the next day, another press release was issued, this time by General Roger Ramey, stating that it was a weather balloon. And that was the start of the best-known and well-documented UFO cover-up in history. Well, here's another look at what was recovered. What it was in reality was a military surveillance balloon that had been launched by the Alamogordo Army Airfield a month earlier. It carried a radar reflector and a classified Project Mogul sensors for experimental monitoring of the Soviet nu nuclear testing program. I mean, back at this time, that's all they had for long-distance surveillance were these high-altitude surveillance balloons. They didn't have the drones and stuff that we have today. Well, to add to the drama, a film was released in 2006 that claimed to be smuggled footage from an autopsy of an alien found at the UFO crash at Roswell, New Mexico. 
The film was viewed by UFO enthusiasts as the smoking gun proof of UFOs and aliens. It was in fact narrated by Jonathan Franks, who played Riker on Star Trek The Next Generation. But the film was a pure fraud. Later, the actors who played the doctors in the film came forward on a talk show and admitted how much they were paid. And eventually, the filmmaker, a guy by the name of Spiros Malaris, admitted to it as regrettable, stating this, For me, it was just a joke, a bit of fun, but I've learned my lesson. Well, the film made millions, but was produced in a London flat with a budget of $39,000, using some cuts from a butcher shop, outdated medical equipment from a film and theater prop shop, some vintage newsreel footage, and the help of a friend who worked in special effects. Ladies and gentlemen, just because something looks good doesn't mean it's real. Well, my hometown of Roswell, New Mexico, is now crazy for UFOs, or rather the tourism dollars that it has brought in. Alien heads can be found on everything from street lamps to vending machines. Everything in Roswell now seems to be UFO-themed. The Arby's is inclusive of alien visitors. You can go to Arby's if you're an alien in Roswell, no problem. Mm -hmm. Flying saucers are fixtures around the town. There's a UFO research center in Roswell. Various shops and stores offer UFO, UFO and alien memorabilia. In fact, my sister has a soap shop, makes soap in Roswell, has a soap shop there in Roswell, and of course they make alien, alien soap as well. Visitors are encouraged to move there so they won't miss the next alien visitation. You don't want to miss the next visitation in Roswell, there's surely to be one. And sadly, the theater where I used to go to movies when I was a kid is now a UFO museum. So sad, the Plains Theater now a UFO museum, can't go see movies at the Plains Theater any longer. And even the McDonald's in Roswell is flying saucer shaped. The only flying saucer shaped McDonald's in the world, I guarantee it. Well, having addressed in part these other causes for the beliefs in extraterrestrial aliens, I want to turn to the number one reason, and that is that evolution and the spontaneous appearance of life is taught today as a scientific fact. The following quote is a view almost universally espoused by natural scientists today. This is from the American scientist in 1995. Life is an obligatory manifestation of matter. Matter is obligated to become life, according to this uh, author. Spontaneous emergence, inevitable under the conditions that existed on the pre-biotic earth. It is bound to occur similarly wherever and whenever similar conditions obtain. There should be plenty of such sites, perhaps as many as one million per galaxy. The universe, the universe is awash with life. Well, today, evolutionists teach that life arose spontaneously in the distant past and teach it as though it's a given fact even though there's not a shred of physical evidence to support the notion. Not a shred. In fact, scientific experiments have conclusively proven the opposite. In 1859, the theory of spontaneous generation was conclusively disproven by this guy. This is Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur is famous for many things other than just this experiment. He was, in fact, the founder of both the sciences of microbiology and immunology. His, his, one of his main contributions to the science was his germ theory of disease, his, his theory that diseases were caused by germs. He went on to identify and isolate several disease-causing organisms. He isolated Staphylococcus that gives rise to staph infection, Streptococcus that gives rise to strep throat, and Pneumococcus that causes pneumonia. He also went, in, went on to, uh, to, uh, to create vaccines for many diseases like uh, cholera, for example, well, to disprove spontaneous generation, he conducted an experiment that was put on that, uh, for a contest that was put on by the French Academies of Science. The French Academies of Science put on a contest for the best experiment, either proving or disproving spontaneous generation. And with this ex simple experiment, he disproved spontaneous generation. What he did was he put some meat broth, some nutrient broth into this flask that you see there, and then he boiled it until it was sterile. Well, 
The flask was open to the air, but the neck was bent the way you see it here. It's called a gooseneck flask. So it was open to the air, wasn't corked in any way, but with it bent this way, nothing could fall into the nutrient broth directly. So after sterilizing it like this, after several days, nothing grew in the flask. There was no spontaneous generation. Then what he did is he tilted the flask so the media could flow up into the neck, the bent part of the neck, and then the media could flow back into the flask. And after just a day, it started to become cloudy as bacteria and fungi started to grow in that media. With this simple experiment, he had disproved spontaneous generation conclusively and also showed that microorganisms are everywhere, even in the air. Well, despite the global acclaim that this experiment received, evolutionists have continued to uphold spontaneous generation. Evolutionists like this guy, Ernst Haeckel. Now, Ernst Haeckel is today infamous mostly for several acts of fraud that he committed to prove evolution. One of them was related to spontaneous generation. He says this, if we do not accept the hypothesis of spontaneous generation, then at this one point in the history of evolution, we must have recourse to the miracle of supernatural creation. Now, this is a full 20 years after Louis Pasteur's experiment. He states this. Now, he goes on to actually fraudulently claimed to have discovered an organism to prove spontaneous generation. He claimed to have discovered primitive protocells that he called monarins and gave them scientific names like proto-amoeba primitivia. He claimed to have discovered a primitive proto-amoeba that he claimed was not, did not composed of any organs at all, but consists entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. He claimed to have discovered organisms Simple cells, much simpler than the cells we have today, to prove spontaneous generation. Published these in a prestigious scientific journal of his day, but it was all fraud. He never had seen these organisms, never discovered these. But he was a professor at Jena University in Germany, which was home to some of the finest optical equipment available to the, of the day. And he just had no excuses for this level of fraud. George Wald says something similar. George Wald was awarded the 1967 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for dis his discoveries concerning the visual processes in the eye. He openly admitted to a belief in the impossible that life arose spontaneously because he could not accept the, uh, the, the, the possibility of supernatural creation. He says this, when it comes to the origin of life, there are only two possibilities. Creation or spontaneous generation. There is no third way. Spontaneous generation was disproved over 100 years ago by Louis Pasteur, but that leads us to only one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. He says, we cannot accept that on philosophical grounds. Therefore, we choose to believe the impossible, that life arose spontaneously by chance. We can't. We cannot accept that on philosophical grounds. They refuse to accept it. And so they choose to believe what they know is impossible. The reason why it's impossible is the cell is tremendously complex. And it's more complex with each new discovery. Actually, drawing an analogy to describe the complexity of the cell is difficult because nothing in human experience really compares to the complexity we have found in the cell. Our marvels of tech, modern technology pale in comparison. Nothing compares short of maybe an entire city. An entire city possesses the complexity we find in the cell. And in fact, you can draw several comparisons between a city and things we've found in the cell. It has, for, for example, an infrastructure like we find in a city. Highways and bridges and buildings with girders. There's an infrastructure. There's also a central library of information the nucleus, and a system to distribute that information where needed. Highways, assemble and disassemble. Highways that armies of transportation vehicles, like the, like the little kinesin walking robot you see here, use to carry manufactured goods from one part of the cell to another part of the cell. There are armies of machines in cells. In fact, factories full of machines. We call many of these organelles, like the mitochondria and the chloroplast. The cell is truly as complex as an entire city. And evolutionists have no explanation how something like this could evolve all on its own through purely natural processes. They have nothing they can put on the table to account for the origin of life. Well, let me give you some of this argument. 
One of the most spectacular discoveries of our generation is that information governs the biological world. Biological information exists in the cells of all organisms as this complex molecule we call DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, this molecule DNA is an instruction. It's a code that tells cells how to make proteins. But it, in fact, does much more than that. I mean, much of the code is the instruction to make proteins, but it also tells the cell what to do with those proteins what they're, when they're made with them. But it is, in fact, the instructions to make a full organism. It's the instructions that are needed to make you, that are contained within this genetic code. And up until recently, evolutionists have claimed that most of the DNA found in the genome was actually junk because they view this information to have come about through purely natural processes. And if this such information came about through natural process alone, most of it would be junk. And they assumed that much of it was junk. But over the last decade or so, it has become abundantly clear, conclusively now, to the chagrin of your evolutionist that there is no junk DNA. I mean, the genetic code is a tremendously complex code, and in fact, it's not just read in one direction like it was originally thought, it's read in both directions. It's a, a three-dimensional information storage, bear, storage structure. It's a complex code. And even Bill Gates said that Gene is by far the most sophisticated program around. It is a very, very complex code. Well, the fact that DNA is coded information causes it to stand as the single most powerful argument for intelligent design that exists. Because in all human experience, we've only found information coming from one source, and that's an intelligent mind. When it was then discovered that information existed in cells governing the biological world, it should have led to the conclusion that the cell was also the result of an intelligent mind, because that's how science is supposed to work. You're supposed to use your past knowledge and experience to inform your observations and reach a conclusion. In all past human experience, information's only been found to come from an intelligent mind. And we have discovered information existing within cells. Well, since intelligence is the only known cause of information, the presence of information in biological systems points definitively to a designing intelligence behind life on Earth. Now, the amount of information packed into the cell is truly mind-boggling. Let me, let me summarize this a bit. To illustrate this, the, what you're looking at there on the left of this diagram is a DNA molecule. It's, what we, it's, it's like a ladder that's twisted into this shape we call a double helix. Well, each step or rung of this ladder is made up of one of four possible molecules we call nucleotides that are abbreviated with the letters A, C, G, and T. Adenosine triphosphate, cytosine triphosphate, guanidine triphosphate, thymidine triphosphate. We abbreviate those with the letters A, T, C, and G, and it's the order of those nucleotides that make up this code. Well, what you're seeing on the right side of this uh, diagram is ge a genetic sequence made up of these letters A, T, Cs, and Gs. Well, if each letter that you see there is equivalent to the letters in our alphabet, if we're talking about the amount of information there, then the amount of information in one human cell is approximately equivalent to the amount that we would find in a thousand books. Letter per letter, there's as many letters in one human cell as there are in a thousand books. Or to put this another way, a small pinhead sized pile of DNA has about as much information as there are in 500 stacks of books reaching the moon or a single stack of books 93 million miles high. The amount of information in a little pinhead sized pile of DNA, a pile of DNA two millimeters in size, has as many letters as you would find in a stack of books 93 million miles high, a stack of books reaching the sun. Well, where do evolutionists say all this information came from? Well, they only have random natural processes at their, at their disposal, and so they attribute it all to mutations. They believe that a DNA molecule magically formed somehow in the beginning in that first cell, something they cannot demonstrate in any way whatsoever experimentally, and then all subsequent genetic information from that first cell on has accumulated through random changes to the original genetic code, what we call mutations. That as the cell copied its DNA, it made some mistakes, adding some changes. When you, the cell was exposed to foreign mutagens like UV bombardment or chemical mutagens, that more changes were made. 
But this assertion by evolutionists that mutations are responsible for the increase in, in the genetic code that changed a bacteria ultimately to a human is just ludicrous. It's one of the most ludicrous assertions of the theory of evolution. And it's something that we all know in our gut to be ridiculous. You cannot, everyone knows you cannot change complex computer, computer code and get more computer code. You cannot randomly change letters in a book and get a second edition of a book or a, another edition of a book. This is, it's an affront to, to logic. It's an affront to reason. It's an affront to common sense to make such an assertion. But that's all they have. And it's nothing short of science fiction. I mean, that's what it is, science fiction. That mutations can cause an improvement to an individual is nothing short of science fiction. What we know in reality is that mutations do nothing but destroy information. They destroy the genetic code and they are not the result of improve. They don't cause improvements, they cause deterioration. They cause genetic diseases and disorders which we are suffering from greatly today. Despite the overwhelming evidence of design, that is biological information, a scientist committed to naturalism must refuse to acknowledge the obvious implications of these observations that the world was created. Francis Crick, shown here, was the co-discoverer of the DNA helix. He won the Nobel Prize for working out the shape of the DNA molecule in 1962. Well, he admitted to seeing evidence of design in the biological world, but states this, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. See, there's so much evidence of design that a biologist, a person with good knowledge of biology, must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed. Constantly keep it in mind because the evidence is so overwhelming. It's constantly bombarding you with observations that would tell you the world was designed. To maintain your worldview of atheism, of evolutionism, you have to constantly remind yourself that it's not true, that the creation is not true. Well, the fact is God has made the world with abundant evidence that it was created. But why can these natural scientists not see the truth? Well, Paul speaks to this in Romans. He says, oh, excuse me, let me back up. He says, for since the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they were, are without excuse. But then listen to this. For even though they knew God, they knew there was a creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the nature of science today. They simply refuse to acknowledge the truth of what they see, and they have become fools in the process. Well, in addition to the origin of genetic information, evolutionists must also account for the origin of proteins. Proteins are the machinery and material that make life possible. The genetic code, remember, by and large, is an instruction to make proteins. Well, in the origin of species, Darwin said this. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find out no such case. Well, back in Darwin's day, they did not know about molecular machines. And molecular machines cannot be built by numerous successive slight modifications. They are complex machines. Every single part of that machine has to be there at the exact same time to work. Machines like the kinesins that you see here. It's a nanoscale micro-walking robot carrying a package of manufactured goods. Machines like the kinesin are irreducibly complex. They simply cannot be built by numerous successive slight modifications. Well, let me explain what proteins are so you understand this argument a little better. In the very top of this diagram, you'll see what is a chain of amino acids. Proteins are first made by assembling together a chain of amino acids, but it's not a protein yet. These chains must first, be, must first must be folded. They're folded into several different shapes, like the beta pleated sheet you see there on the left, or the alpha helices on the right side. These different shapes are then assembled together to make what is really just a subunit of a protein. It's still not a protein. Several subunits then must be assembled together to make a functional protein, and machines like the ATP synthase shown here are made up of hundreds of subunits. 
The ATP synthase has 500 separate subunits that have to be assembled together to make this protein machine. And this is a complex turbine engine. This machine is one of the machines responsible for converting glucose, what is blood sugar, into cellular, the cellular energy molecule we call ATP. Well, what do scientists, what do evolutionists have to account for the origin of proteins? Actually, very little, in fact. The most famous experiment that attempted to solve the mystery of the origin of proteins was conducted in the 1950s by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey to see if they could get amino acids, those are the building blocks of proteins, to form in a simulated Earth atmosphere. They, they sought to see if they could get the building blocks of proteins to form under natural conditions by creating, again, a theoretical atmosphere of the Earth, which included a water cycle. So their apparatus contained an in, an, a place where they could input some materials, and they input methane as a carbon source, ammonium as a nitrogen source, hide some hydrogen. They also added some uh, water vapor by a, the boiling flask of water there. They put a spark chamber in there to get some energy in there to get those molecules moving around further and encourage some uh, interactions. They put a condenser in there to bring those molecules close together and uh, stimulate some condensation reactions. And they put a port on the bottom where they could collect some materials. And from the material they collected, they did find about 2% amino acids. They did find some amino acids. It was what was mostly toxic sludge. But there were several problems with this experiment. And believe me, if you look at a biology textbook today on evolution that talks about the origin of life, you will see this experiment <laughs> described because, again, this is really all they have is this one experiment to uh, show how proteins could form. But there were several problems with this experiment. Again, what they were supposed to be constructing was a simulated Earth atmosphere. But they put methane, ammonium, hydrogen gas, and some water vapor in there. There's something very obviously missing from the Earth atmosphere that they were supposed to be simulating, and that is oxygen. Well, the reason why they didn't put oxygen there is, is well known to biochemists. Oxygen is an oxidizing agent. It strips electrons off of other atoms or molecules and would destroy amino acids. Any good biochemist knows that amino acids won't form in the presence of oxygen, and if you're exposed to oxygen, amino acids will be destroyed. And so they intentionally did not put oxygen in this apparatus, and early theorists assumed that the early atmosphere of the Earth, when life first evolved, was, did not have oxygen. It was a reducing atmosphere. But this was conclusively shown by, by geologists way back in the 1980s to just be completely wrong. For example... This is a quote from the uh, Bulletin of American Meteor Meteorological Society in 1982. They say, geologists know from their analysis of the oldest known rocks that the oxygen level of the early atmosphere had to be much higher than previously calculated. From the journal Geology in 1982, they say there is no scientific proof that the Earth ever had a non-oxygen atmosphere such as evolutionists require. Earth's oldest rocks contain evidence of being formed in an oxygen atmosphere. They dug deeper and deeper in the Earth's crust and they find rocks that are, that are oxides that, that were formed in an oxygen atmosphere. The Earth never had a reducing atmosphere and this is now a well-known thing. Well, despite this massive fundamental problem with the Miller-Urey experiment, again, this experiment that was back in the 1950s, the results of this experiment continue to appear in literally every biology textbook that discusses evolution, in particular that discusses the origin of life. For example, Prentice Hall Biology, one of the most widely used biology textbooks used in U.S. public schools today, said this. Over a few days, several amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, began to accumulate. Miller and Urey's experiments suggested how mixtures of organic compounds necessary for life could have arisen from simpler compounds present on the primitive Earth. But this is simply not true. The experiments did not produce anything resembling, quote, mixtures of organic compounds necessary for life. It is a well-known fact that the majority of really important organic molecules, like proteins and DNA, have building blocks that exist in only one of their two possible forms. This experiment produced what's called a racemic mixture, which is what you would expect in any kind of natural formation. 
However, the amino acids used to make proteins only exist in the left-handed form. In a natural environment, both left and right-handed forms will be, will be formed, but in every protein possessed by every organism on Earth, you only have the left-handed form of these amino acids. In the nucleic acids that are in both RNA and DNA, the ribose molecule, the sugar molecule in those nucle nucleotides are only in the right-handed form. <clears throat> The most widely, ex uh, I won't go into the, the most widely accepted theory on this, but uh, they do uh, they argue that mo maybe these substances formed on, uh, maybe uh, uh, the uh, charged substances like clays or crystals could have uh, accounted for uh, the formation of more of one type of amino acid than, than another. But if scientists have experimented with this, and although they can get the percentage to shift a little bit in one direction, Again, proteins don't have just more left-handed amino acids, they have all left-handed amino acids. Well, another major problem with the experiment in the 1950s is that they obtained no chains of amino acids, or what we call polymers. Because amino acids react more readily with other molecules than amino acids, <clears throat> a chain of amino acids forming under natural conditions is highly unlikely. In fact, researchers have determined that the probability of obtaining a single chain of 150 amino acids by chance alone is 1 out of 10 to the 164th power. That's to get a chain of only 150 amino acids. That's a trillion, 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 trillion times smaller than the odds of finding a single specific particle amongst all the particles in the known universe. The law of probability states that the occurrence of any event where the chance is beyond 1 in 10 to the 50th, a much smaller figure than what we're dealing with here, is an event that we can state with certainty will never happen, no matter how much time is allotted, no matter how many conceivable opportunities could exist for the event to take place, it is, will not happen. Also, please note that many proteins, like these big enzymes, are much, much larger than 150 amino acids. The ATP synthase, shown again here, has more than 2,000 amino acids. The RNA polymerase, which transcribes DNA into RNA, has more than 3,000. And both of these are absolutely required by all life. Well, Francis Crick, again, the co-discoverer of the DNA helix, was honest enough about the possibility of spontaneous protein formation to admit that it was impossible. He said this, if a particular amino acid sequence was selected by chance, how rare an event would this be? The great majority of sequences can never have been synthesized at all at any time. Francis Crick. Well, it is due to these challenges that the origin of life from space, termed astrobiology or exobiology, has become NASA's main focus. That's why they're searching for water on planets, like Mars, and for, they're looking for amino acids on asteroids and meteorites. On this slide, I put two different discoveries of, of amino acids have been discovered on asteroids. The one on the bottom, from 2012, the 2012 discovery, they stated that they had found four times more of one type of amino acid on an asteroid than another. A similar report came out just recently, too, of another similar discovery. But again, proteins do not have just more left-handed amino acids. They have all left-handed amino acids. Pools of chiral molecules like that simply do not exist, do not form naturally, period. Well, a meteorite was discovered in Antarctica back in 1984. This is when Bill Clinton was president. That was reported to have signs of life. Clinton said this, if this discovery is confirmed, it would surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever discovered. Well, the claim was due to this scanning electron microscope image that appears to reveal structures that were argued to be fossilized remains of bacteria-like life forms. Carbon compounds were also found that were argued to be organic in, in, in origin, meaning formed by an organism. However, as of 2005, the scientific consensus is now that these supposed microfossils and organic compounds are not evidence of Martian life after all. Researchers have now analyzed 11 such Martian meteorites like this one, including the new Tissant meteorite that fell in the Moroccan desert back in 2011. 
Their conclusion is that these supposed signs of life actually formed from volcanic processes. Ten of the meteorites analyzed possessed complex hydrocarbons that were encased in grains of crystallized minerals that formed within cooling magma. And very interestingly, this was a conclusion that was put forth in the Creation magazine back in 2002. In one of our Creation Science publications, they predicted this in 2002. See, if your worldview is correct, you're likely to, your theories are more likely to align with the truth. Your conclusions are more likely to be accurate. Well, NASA has now sent over 10 spacecrafts to the planet Mars, and each at a cost of between $100 million and several billion dollars. The primary purpose of these missions was to find signs of life. NASA's Perseverance rover has become the latest to touch down on the red planet. It landed just this past February 2021 and was one of the most expensive missions at a cost of $2.7 billion. Well, the goal of this latest mission to Mars is summarized, was summarized by NASA. They said this, one of the mission's primary goals is to explore the geology of the Jezera crater in order to assess past habitability. The rover Perseverance will provide important data relevant to astrobiology research, along with a vast amount of geological information about the landing site and the planet at large that will help put the astrobiological data into context. Perseverance will not be looking for organisms living on Mars today. However, the rover will collect data that could be used to identify biosignatures of ancient microbial life. This has become NASA's main focus, to look for signs of life elsewhere, because it has become apparent, abundantly apparent to scientists today that life could not have originated here on Earth. So they're hoping it somehow got here from somewhere else. Again, it's due to the inability of evolution to demonstrate how life originated here they're looking, that they're looking for evidence of life in space. Francis Crick, again shown here, reasoned that life could not have evolved from lawn living chemicals under any conceivable conditions on Earth. And he stated this, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at them almost to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. But the idea of a creator was unacceptable to Francis Crick since it would go against his atheistic faith. Therefore, he proposed in his book, Life Itself, that life came to earth from space. Well, some believe that life might have arrived being carried by an asteroid, a theory known as panspermia. But others see this to be logistically impossible. Crick does and believes that life was in fact shipped to Earth billions of years ago in spaceships by supposedly more evolved and therefore more advanced aliens beings. Sadly, these concepts about evolution and, and aliens that are endorsed by such top scientists make their way into popular science fiction shows like the movie I mentioned previously, Mission to Mars, and are then adopted by many as a worldview. If you have doubts about this assertion, note this massive painting that's on the side of the Roswell UFO Museum and Research Center. If you don't connect this painting up with something else, this is a painting that was clearly taken from Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam Fresco on the Sistine Chapel. The belief in aliens is not only the foundation for a worldview to many, but a belief that they look looked to as a source of their own existence, but it is also, to many, a full-on religion. Before I close, there is one last concern I want to address, and that is that many believe in extraterrestrial aliens due to the prevalence of reports of alien encounters and abductions. Polls had found that close to 2% of participants reported being contacted by aliens or abducted by aliens. If this is true, that would mean nearly 4 million Americans. So what is happening here? There's too many of these reports to just dismiss them outright. 
Too many people have reported such things. So what's happening here? Are these really alien encounters? A number of ufologists, people that study UFOs and UFO phenomena, have begun to understand that something else is going on. Mackay stated in the journal Flying Saucer Review, yes, there is a, a journal that's on flying saucers. In the Flying Saucer Review, Mackay states, now it is an interesting fact that the information gained due to human involvement with extraspatial entities in the field of UFOlogies, ufology is almost exactly mirrored by what has been understood with the esoteric, that is the occult, fraternities from time immemorial. Now you might remember the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Steven Spielberg movie. Some, like Stephen Greer, shown here, claim to have what they call close encounters of the fifth kind, where they are visited by aliens by inviting them with their consciousness during meditation. You can actually find a documentary created by this guy that's called The Close, close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. I took these pictures from uh, that documentary. Stephen Greer will go out into the wild with some of his followers, and they will sit in circles and engage in what seem like seance-type sessions where he and his most spiritually enlightened followers will reach out with pure thoughts and kind hearts to the occupants of these interplanetary transdimensional crafts and beckon them into our realm. And they claim to have been visited during these sessions by orbs of light appearing in the distance. You can see the picture on the right, the orbs appearing in the distance. And the picture on the left, they claim that when they shined a laser at uh, one of these orbs that another appeared in response. Oh, it's troubling stuff. Interestingly, there are a number of troubling parallels between alien contacts and occult phenomena. For example, people record huge chunks of missing time that cannot be accounted for, or are claimed to aliens are claimed to walk through walls, and people are often taken up into spaceships through the ceilings of their homes. Let me go through a number of these troubling parallels, again, between people that have experienced alien encounters and those that are engaged in occult behavior, like seances. Nauseous odors are encountered in seance rooms, haunted, lo haunted house locations, and alien encounter sites. Falling materials or deposits of substances are found in both seances and poltergeist phenomena, like the ectoplasm or your, what they call falling stones, and UFO phenomena, like what they call angel, angel's hair or oily fluids. There's an aversion to strong light uh, by both seance apparitions and aliens share this characteristic. Voices are heard in the minds of both participants. Levitation and teleportation are reported in both participants. Again, seances or uh, those that have experienced alien encounters. Decreases or increases in temperature are reported in both. Instantaneous, instantaneously appearing or disappearing or enlargement or reduction of phenomena are reported in both. Similarity in entity characteristics are reported in both. They're both reported as being transparent, incomplete, semi-solid, or vaporous in form. Unusual noises and high-pitched sounds have been reported in both. The inapplicability of physical laws are reported in both. They don't seem to be governed by our natural laws. There's the dreamlike qualities of some encounters and distortions and or breaking up of normal time sequences are found in both. Similar effects on humans physically and psychologically are reported in both. For example, uh, being controlled by another entity, prickling sensations, tingling sensations, temporary paralysis have been reported in both. Well, paranormal and UFO researcher John Keel, who's probably best known as the author of the Mothman Prophecies, a book that was later made into a movie starring Richard Gere, says this, the UFOs do not seem to exist as tangible manufactured objects. They do not conform to the natural laws of our environment. They seem to be nothing more than transmogrifications tailoring themselves to our abilities to understand. The thousands of contacts with entities indicate that they are liars and put on artists. The UFO manifestations seem to be, by and large, merely minor variations of the age-old demonological phenomenon. 
He continues, The victims of demonomalia, that is, uh, possessions, suffer the very same medical and emotional symptoms as the UFO contactees. The devil, he says, and his demons can, according to the literature, manifest themselves in almost any form and can physically imitate anything from angels to horrifying monsters with glowing eyes. Strange objects and entities materialize and dematerialize in these stories, just as the UFOs and their splendid occupants appear and disappear, walk through walls and perform other supernatural feats. Nick Redfern, shown here, who is a UFO investigator, who is a regular guest on the History Channel show UFO Hunters, says this, we're dealing with something that coexists with us and which masquerades as extraterrestrial. There's the nature of the entities themselves. They practically overemphasize who or what they claim to be. We only have to take a careful look at such cases to see that these incidents are clearly staged, managed. It's a game, a scenario that has everything to do with trying to emphasize the E.T. meme. Of course, they could easily avoid us, but here's the deal. They want to be seen. It's not an accident. It's carefully planned, and it's designed to plant an image of E.T. scientist in the minds of the witnesses. Well, clearly many of the claims about UFOs and alien encounters are fraudulent. People love fooling other people and love being the center of attention, and for some there's been monetary gain. And to accomplish these things, people will go to extraordinary lengths. However, that some of these encounters might be demonic is compelling and fits well with the character of Satan who himself took the form of a serpent to deceive Eve. Jesus describes Satan this way in John 8, 44. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Well, due to the belief in evolution and the popular cultural idea that older, technologically advanced aliens are visiting the earth, today people are ripe for deception. For someone who has never been to church, read a Bible, or known Jesus as their Savior, such teachings can cause people to reject all thought of God as their creator and judge. This is just the sorts of signs and wonders that Satan would use to reinforce this powerful delusion. As said by Paul in 2 Thessalonians, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceive those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Well, sadly, due to this deception, when people look at the heavens today, they tend to ponder what else might be out there. Instead, we should be considering in all the one who made the majestic heavens. For as Psalm, the psalmist says in 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaim the work of his hands. Before I close in a prayer, I want to quickly put up the code for a, a short quiz for those watching online. This video will be available online and you can get the QR code there. Let me go ahead and close in a prayer. Father God, we, uh, we thank you so much for your word that has given us such insight into this world that you've made for us, Father. And Father, we understand that Satan is at work, that he has uh, the father, that he is the father of lies and he has used lies to deceive many, deceive them with evolution, deceive them with uh, the thought that there may be countless alien civilizations out there and therefore this place is insignificant father god we ask for wisdom well we need wisdom father to help us understand the science that's being used to attack your word father god your truth we need wisdom to help us understand the science we need wisdom to help us be an effective witness for you lord god father god and we ask today for boldness 
Help us to be bold, Father, with, uh, with those we meet on a daily basis, with our friends and our coworkers. And Father God, help us to be a witness for you, Lord God, with boldness, Father God. Help us to remember that we are in possession of a great truth and that the world is lost. The world is truly lost. Having been deceived by the father of lies, been deceived by those that have rejected you, rejected your existence, and are doing their best to convince the world that you do not exist. Father God, help us to be bold with our testimonies, to uphold the truth of creation, our belief in your word, and Father God, to be bold in our testimony about Jesus, your Son, who has died to save us from our sins. Father God, we praise you. Father God, we glorify and honor you. Father God, today we worship your holy name. Praise you, Lord God. We thank you for today, Lord. Father God, again, we ask for wisdom, Father God, to help us understand this world, to understand the science. And we ask for boldness to be a witness for you, Lord God. Help us to be bold. We know that our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, those, everyone that around us is lost, that we're surrounded by a world that is lost, full of lost people. Father God, help us to be bold in our testimony. We praise you, Lord God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.